call to worship today is to be loved by God is the highest relationship, the highest achievement, and the highest position in life. Henry Blackaby. If you will now stand, we will sing hymn 363, To God Be the Glory. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
If we continue to stand, we will have the praise song, Break Every Chain.
make good decisions to have to work together um, as a group and keep in mind the ideas we had here. Um, and I feel like it should be a change in the slide for Yep. Continue to pray for the, the North Back Moms as they're going to uh, have some, some people that are out from outside of the church to be a part of this. And so just prayer as, as God leads us collectively. Oh? Uh, I don't know the lady's last name. Her first name is Barb, and she's the manager of Nottles in Carterville, and she's having a heart attack tomorrow. Anyone else? Any prayers for, for Vicki and Steve as they go throughout their journey as well? Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come together, that we can be one body before you. And Lord, we thank you for calling us together that we can call this, this church body family. We know, Lord, that throughout the week and, and as we fight our battles and our struggles, Lord, as we seek to live for you, that we know as you have brought us together with this group that we are not alone, that we have our brothers and sisters who love us, who love us like their own uh, brothers and sisters and continue to lift us up in prayer support, continue to lift us up by, by checking in on us. And Lord, we just thank you for that kind of love, for that kind of support and biblical example that, that we receive from this church. Lord, so we do ask that you continue to be a God of comfort and peace to those who um, are hurting and those who are struggling. Lord, be with not just those who are afflicted, but their families as well, as they continue to care and have concern about their loved ones. And Lord, you can be praised for the blessings that we received. The lock-in was, was great, Lord, but we also praise you for uh, answered prayer, and we give you praise for the battles that we do face in life as well. That we're able to overcome because we have a God who is perfect, a God who loves us, and a God who we can trust forevermore. And so I pray, Lord, that just like you're saying, that we'll have uh, faith to know that our God can break every chain, everything that binds us to this world, everything that keeps us from uh, fully worshiping and, and trusting in you, Lord, that you have broken those chains through your sacrifice and through your love for us. So I pray that you never forget that truth, that we never quit living that truth, and others will come to experience that as well by the way that we choose to love you back. So, Lord, I ask that you be with us now as we open up our, our scriptures, as we focus on what it means to, to fight against temptation. I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to be fully in your presence at this time. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Judges. We're going to go to verse, our verse. We're going to go to chapter 14. For our reading, and then I'm going to ask after we're done reading that, jump to 13, and we're going to go through the life of Samson a little bit this morning. Judges 14. We're going to read verses 1 through 9 together, kind of set the stage of the life of Samson so we can look at as we face our relationships with God, our relationship with uh, one another, with our loved ones. Just how temptation can have an effect on those relationships. Judges chapter 14, beginning of verse 1. Once Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw a Philistine woman. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw a Philistine woman at Timnah, now get her from me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there a woman among your kin, or among all our people, that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, because she pleases me. His father and mother did not know that this was from the Lord, for he was seeking a pretext to act against the Philistines. At that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Verse 5, Then Samson, Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah. When he came to the vineyard of Timnah, suddenly a young lion roared at him. The Spirit of the Lord rushed on him, and he tore the lion apart, barehanded, as one might tear apart a kid. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson. After a while, he returned to marry her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. 
He straightened out with his hands and went on eating as he went. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some of some to them and ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the carcass of the lion. And we'll talk about that significance in a minute. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, for examples in Scripture of um, how we can turn back to you, Lord, after we fall, after we turn against you, and after we um, try to remove ourselves from your presence. But we all also see how you always continue to give us opportunities, Lord, to turn back to you, and in those moments, you will always love us. Amen. If you want to flip Matthew 13, chapter 13, we're going to be there in a moment, and then we will make our way to all the way to chapter 16. So if you're thinking this is a, a long sermon, you might be right. Look at that. So a couple weeks ago, in our intentional sermon series, we saw us move from a focus of having an intentional faith to now we're focusing on having intentional relationships. And the last time we were together, we talked about the most important, the top priority, our first relationship that we should have the most focus on is our relationship with Christ. Our relationship with Him has to be the most important because it sets the foundation and the mold for all other relationships. And so we spent some time talking about how we as believers should be putting our time and our efforts into that relationship first and foremost. Because nothing else will endure the storms of life and the trials of life, um, and that relationship has to be strong. It has to be the one that we measure all others up against. So as we move forward this month, we're going to take a look at studying the importance of having Christ-centered relationships. And today I want to bring our focus to the most dangerous obstacle of having Christ-centered relationships, and that's temptation. When temptation leads us to sin, that can be a pretty big obstacle in our life. When temptation confronts us and we're not strong enough or we don't have Christ at the center of, of that relationship or that journey, temptation will derail us. It will hurt us. It can have a major effect on our lives and especially our relationships. So today's sermon, you may be pretty familiar with the story of Samson. You may know it really well, and that's okay. But through that, we want to see how we can not only avoid some of the mistakes he made, but also learn from them so that our relationships don't take the same hit that his did. Samson's story is pretty exciting if you know him. It's, pretty, it's a pretty neat story. It's one that's full of action. But in many ways, it's a tragic story as well. How many of you have never heard the story of Samson? Anybody? Okay, good. Then you guys will be pretty well versed in that. Or you're just scared to raise your hand and it'll be a surprise. We'll see what happens. <laughs> One of the privileges we have as we look into his life is that we get to see him in different relationships. We get to see him in his relationship with God. We get to see him in his relationship with his parents, his relationship with the women, his relationship with his friends. And so we get to see him in many different avenues. And so, one of the privileges as we look into his life with his parents and his friends and his significant others, but most importantly with God, is we're going to be able to say, what went wrong? What did he do that went wrong? Where did Samson get off the path of what God had in store for him? Where did Samson call an audible and go his own way instead of following God's plan? And we might be able to ask ourselves, how did the most powerful man to ever walk the plan get sidetracked? Temptation. And let's see if we can unravel this mystery this morning so that we can avoid the path of temptation that he went down. See, if you ask me, my opinion, my opinion is that the root of all of Samson's problem was the failure to recognize and avoid temptation. Not just avoiding temptation, but recognize that he was heading down the path of temptation. Recognize that he was being enticed to follow the road of temptation. And as you go throughout this story this morning, Samson was slowly but steadily on a path to destruction. And let's see if we can identify where he went wrong so that we can avoid doing those same things. Take a look at Judges chapter 13, verse, and we're going to start at verse 3. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to a woman and said to her, Although you are bearing, having born no children, you shall receive their son. Now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, or to eat anything unclean, for you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor is to come to his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite 
to God from birth. It is he who shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So that kind of sets a story. That's, that's uh, Samson's mom. And we now have the story of what the pact between him and God was. The things that he was to avoid. And so the first thing I, I noticed about the story of Samson as we begin reading at least for me is that from the beginning, before he was born, God had what? He had a plan for his life. God had a plan for him. And you see, God allowed the Philistines to rule over the Jewish people for so long. A lot of the sermons I preach is talking about the redemption, right? It's talking about different people that God had ordained to be the leadership to take over, to battle back, to fight against. And so now Samson was being pegged as being that person. God had a plan for his life. For over 40 years, they were being ruled over. And the Philistines were ruling over them because of their disobedience to God. And so now we see that Samson has been pegged as his choice, God's choice, to rescue God's people. And Samson's job was to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And I believe that, in my opinion, Samson probably never fully understood his purpose in life. And I wonder how many of us, and Pam made me think about this in her message this weekend, how many of us never really realize our full potential that God has for us? Pam made a pretty good illustration. She talked about us as Christians, and one of the things we do is we come to, to know Christ, know about Him, learn about Him, accept him as Savior, and then she gave the example is we'll even go through what baptism and we had a physical, we didn't baptize but we had a physical example out here of what a baptism looked like, being unclean, being dead, and then coming up and having new life, but then there was a there was a moment where she said then what? And for a lot of time I lived my life there, then what? What happens? What about the purpose God has after that point? What do you do with it? <laughs> and I think that Samson never realized his purpose I think he never realized the full potential that God had for his life. The plan God had for him. I believe that he was so self-absorbed that he never saw in the box of what was good for Samson. What was good for him. He never realized that God had a plan for him. And that made falling into temptation very easy. Because if you don't have purpose, you'll fall for everything. So he was the center of the own universe. So Satan's job to lure him away from God was probably a very simple one. And for Samson, when it comes to our relationship with God and others, we must see today that there are several reasons to avoid temptation. And if you want to avoid temptation, church, and the destruction that comes with it, the first thing we have to do is, is exactly that. We have to see God's plan. We have to see God's plan and the plan that he has for you. Many of you know that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, it's plastered everywhere these days. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to give you a hope in the future, for you to prosper. We have to know the plan that God has for us. My favorite part of that is verse 13, just two verses later. It says, seek me and find me when you seek me with what? Your whole heart. So he's saying this, that if you really want to know my plan for you, if you're sitting here wondering, what's next, God? And the answer is, you have to seek me. And you don't just seek me with a part of who you are. You seek me with your whole heart. Your whole desire has to be seeking God's will for your life. And where are you at this morning? See, it doesn't matter what age you are. Until he calls us home, we have a purpose. And that purpose is to seek God's plan for our lives and to live it out. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So it's saying when we know God's will for our lives and we follow those steps, we'll feel the light. We'll feel the blessing. We'll receive that. So what is his plan for you? If you're a follower of Christ's church and his plan is simple, he wants you to live a life that is totally dedicated to serving him, to living for him, to being in relationship with him. He wants you to have a life that's centered on him. He wants you to go to your workplace with him lifted high. So that all your co-workers can see him. He wants you to live with your family, constantly lifting him high. So that your family grows and develops into a Christ-honoring, God-fearing, Christ-centered family. He wants you to tell everyone about the way he ransomed your soul. And some of you are saying, yeah, I just don't have the words to say or not good. Fine, live it out. Live it out. Be it to the moment. 
He wants you to have a close and personal relationship with Him every day. He wants to work through you to reach a lost and dying world. That's His plan for us. So the first step to avoid falling into to, to temptation is to see and recognize that God has a plan for you. And the very next chapter in Judges shows us a grown up thing. Turn over back to verse 14. <laughs> And if you need to refer to this, we can, but it's the passage that we read. We see that Samson is, is growing up, and that he start, as he grows up, he wasn't doing very well at, at uh, <coughs> avoiding temptation. He decides to go down to Tim, which is a Philistine town, and his purpose, remember, his purpose for God's will for him was to destroy them, to destroy these people. To get into their towns and socialize was not a part of God's plan. And definitely not to marry them. We find out that he marries one of them. And later in the chapter, we see Samson making no effort to avoid temptation any longer. But now he's looking for it. Now he's falling into it. And we see as they go down to Timna, he destroys a lion. And then later on, he goes through and he takes the honey out of an unclean animal's mouth, and now his parents have also broken the path that God had given to them. See, there, there are three parts of, of Samson's Nazarite vow that God put before his parents before he was born. He was never to cut his hair, and that's the part that most of us know about Samson. And he was not to eat any drink or have any fruit from the vine, and he was not to ever touch anything unclean. And he knew that vow. As he got older, his parents educated him on that vow. He knew those three things set him apart from other people. So what was he doing in the vineyard without his parents? He was looking for temptation. God knew he wasn't supposed to be there, so he sends a lion to chase him out. God gives him the strength to kill the lion. And I believe that God was trying to do two things for Samson. One, keep him from breaking his vow by eating the grapes. And two, remind him that he had been given the strength not just to kill lions, but destroy the Philistines. And if we continue to read that, we see what happened. We see that he didn't avoid temptation. Instead, he continues to keep his life centered and focused on himself, and that leads him into some trouble. He didn't get the hint. He didn't see that it was a problem. Later on, he goes back, and he looks at the lion, and he sees that some bees have made honey in the dried-out carcass. He scoops it up, he eats it, and then he shares it with his parents. He fell into temptation. He didn't tell them where he got it from, and so now they're receiving, they're receiving something unclean as well. So he broke the first part of his vow. He was never to touch anything unclean, and he had. He then goes into town, and now we, we see the second part of his vow. He goes into the town, and he gets drunk. He's at his bachelor party, and he breaks the second part of his vow. How could Samson have avoided that? By staying away. By staying away and by being in, in connection to what God's will was. By backing up and not going to this little Philistine town, he would never been tempted. He would have never been tempted by the third part, which was the women. He would have never been tempted. He would have entered the vineyard and he never would have touched the line. He never would have gotten drunk at a bachelor party. He never would have continued the downward spiral. And I think we can learn from Samson that a good way to avoid falling into temptation is to stay away from the people and the places where we'll be tempted to begin with. <coughs> Unless God directly calls us there with a purpose in that moment, if it causes us to stumble, we need to be cautious of that. And I think we learn avoiding temptation is not easy, but it can be done. The second thing we learn is staying away from different areas of temptation. Genesis 4, 7 tells us that if something is not well and it's not accepted, stay away from it. Because if you don't, then sin will be present. If you allow yourself to continue to be around things that tempt you, eventually sin is going to enter your life. The Bible tells you to be careful and watchful, expecting to be tempted. That Satan wants to destroy us, that Satan wants to knock us down. And our only defense to follow God actively, church, is to resist Satan. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us that. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking 
who we can devour. James 4, 7 tells us, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I think Samson had another problem too. After his lion experience, you know what I think, in my opinion, happened to him? He got cocky. Oh, man, I took out a lion. I am the strongest around. I did it with my bare hands. And so now something dangerous happens and it can happen to all of us if we're not careful. He starts to think that he's doing all of this on what? His own power. His own strength. That he doesn't need God. That he is able to do this. That he's a self-made man and that is dangerous. And I think if we're honest, how many of us can say that we've had that struggle before, thinking we're self-made? That's a dangerous place to go. It's hard to get out. We need to stay away from areas of temptation. Take a look at verse 12. Chapter 14. Samson's at his bachelor party. And we see that he's just on a slippery slope. Sin after sin, temptation after temptation. So he gets to the bachelor party, and in verse 12 he says to his friends, let me put a riddle to you. If you can explain it to me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 festal garments. Let me stop there. That's a, a large sum of money today. So he's saying, you're not going to understand this. I'm pretty confident that I'm smarter than you. And so if by chance you do, I'm going to give you the most, the most money I can. I'm going to give you a large prize. And so he begins to tell them. But he says this, if you cannot explain it to me, then you have to give that money to me. So they said to him, ask your riddle, let us hear it. And he said to them this, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. But for three days they could not explain the riddle. And then on the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Coach your husband to explain the riddle to us, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. So here he is. Samson thinks he's something. He thinks he's doing all of this on his own will, that he's strong because of him, that he's smart because of him. And now he's going he's to push the envelope and say, I'm going to make a little money off this. I'm going to have some fun. But now these guys are serious because of the amount of money that it really is. And they go to his wife and say, hey, find out this answer or it's over. Family, be gone. Find out this answer for us is serious business now. And for Samson, it really is kind of a clever riddle if you, if you look at it. It would be very difficult for them to solve unless you knew what had happened in the video. Yeah. And so Samson, we see here, is a proud Samson, a cocky Samson. A Samson that's trusting and relying on his own strength and his own wit to get by. And the result of the real is that his wife betrays him. You continue to read on that story. And he gets out of town and kills 30 men to pay the debt of the lost wager. And his wife and her family are burned to death on top of that. Samson then captures about 300 foxes, scripture says, tied the tails together, lights them on fire, and uses that to destroy the Philistines' wheat and other crops. And all of this commotion was caused simply because Samson was focused on himself and took things into his own hands instead of obeying God's plan. That leads us to the next step of not yielding to temptation, and that's this. Spotlight. Make important God's plan and his work in your life. Make it the top priority. Don't just know it and be aware of it, which was our first couple of steps, but make it the priority. How do we do that? Get into God's Word. Get into God's Word and know, know it. And more importantly, apply it to our lives so that it illuminates the path that God has chosen for us. Psalm 119 says it best, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. How's the rest of that go? And right into my path. Another major problem that Samson had when he was looking for happiness in all the wrong places. He was looking for love in all the wrong places too, and I imagine that growing up probably wasn't easy for Samson. He probably stood out. He's the strongest guy. He's got prettier hair than the women, right? And so it probably wasn't easy for him. He stood out, I and mean, he might have been ridiculed, I don't know. But seriously though, I think, in my opinion, that Samson probably wasn't a very happy person from what I read. I probably think that he didn't like being different. And Kyle and I are a small group uh, at the lobby, and we talked about that. It's hard to be different. It's hard to be different from our peers. It's hard to stand out from them. And when we bring our faith into it where it's not accepted as widely as it should be, it's hard. 
And so he probably wasn't too happy because it's hard being different. It's hard setting apart. And he probably wanted more than anything to be like everyone else. And I think he resented this vow that God placed on him before he was born. I think he really struggled with that. I think he resented not having a choice in the matter. And I think he was unhappy with his life, so he sought happiness in the arms of temptation, in the arms of sin. And I think that sin and rebellion made him happy, but only for a season of life. But I also think it led to his ultimate destruction. So to avoid the pitfalls of temptation, church, we need to search for happiness by accomplishing God's will. If you want to know where to find happiness, true happiness, scriptural happiness, it's in the will of God for your life. It's hard to be tempted to do things that you know are wrong when we are at the center of God's will. When we put God before us and have him at the, the head of what we do, It'll be harder to fall into temptation because we know that that opposes his will. It doesn't mean that we can't fall into that temptation, but it means that it will make it harder to surrender to it. And church, I don't know about you, but there's no better feeling and no happier existence than knowing that you are living in the perfect will of God. We can have some crummy days, but I tell you, some of my best days are knowing that I'm doing what God wants me to do. That I'm fulfilling what God has planned for me to do. Those are some of the best days that I have when I realize that that is taking place. Romans 12.2. Sound familiar, Sophie? Romans 12.2 is a verse that Ham had the kids learn in a very short amount of time, and I think they did a pretty good job, but it's something that we need to keep, and I'm, I bet Samson wishes he would have known at that time. Do not be conformed to this world, but yet be transformed by what, Sophie? Amen. The renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is good, perfect, and acceptable the will of God. To live that way, to discover what God's perfect plan is in your life, church, brings us to the next thing, must to let God over the things of this world, and that's hard. It doesn't matter what stage of life we're in, it's hard to continuously seek God and select God and His will for our lives over the things of this world. Scripture teaches us that no man can serve two masters. We have to choose. 1 John 2.15 says, love the world, other things that are, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world are, are for the world. And any man, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Church, whatever temptation you may be facing right now, maybe it's to separate yourself from God because you don't like the answers that he's provided, you don't like the method that he's taking taking uh, control of things. You don't like the path that he's put you down. Maybe that's a temptation today. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe your temptation and the avenue through it is the internet. Maybe it's to make things with other gods. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I know there's two doors to give us that illustration. There's a door, number one, that God's behind, and door number two, which is our temptation. We cannot have both doors. We have to choose one. Samson chose the door, but did not have God's will behind it. In the final chapter of the story of Samson, we have another character introduced. That's who? Delilah. That she was a different story. We'll talk about her later. What a name. Did anybody ever know anyone named Delilah? I personally don't. I've heard it on TV and I've seen some names, but it carries a stigma with it if you know this passage. It's almost synonymous in this, in this setting with sin. Right? We read the story and then we can we can correlate that that's an equal sin. Samson is looking for love again in all the wrong places. He ends up in bed with Delilah. And is in the chapter that the cost of temptation finally catches up to him. And you know the story. She literally nads him to death in order to gain the secret of his strength. Remember that. His strength did not come from the hair but through the spirit of God. And that was the last part of his vow that he had kept. And so now it's in danger. And as soon as Delilah had taken the secret away from him and had his hair cut, the Spirit of God left him because all three parts of his vow were not compromised. And the true tragedy of this part of the story is that when he wakes up after his hair is cut, he didn't realize that the Spirit of God had left. 
think we had this discussion, Kyle, and maybe with Mike, that we, a lot of times in Scripture, can look at Samson, and he's in Hebrews 11 as a hero of our faith, but he got a lot of struggle, too. He's really relatable to us as, as Christians. That why we can do things that are um, seen before God and, and poured, um, before God and, and in the presence of God that can be considered great. We all struggle, and we have to get to the point of allowing God to be the one who shines through. But she nags him to death, and we see that now he didn't even realize because he had been walking in sin for so long that the vow had been broken and that the Spirit of God had left him. That speaks volumes to how far away from being with God that Samson truly was. When you don't realize that you're not in his presence anymore, that's pretty scary. That's pretty bad. But it was all because of a failure to avoid temptation. It was all because of a failure to make God the most important thing in his life. And the results of the final flirtation with sin were grievous. Judges 16, look at verse 21. Philistines took him, put his eyes out, brought him down to Gaza, found him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. The next thing we see from Samson is that when we sin, when we do fall into temptation, which every single one of us will do, we must do this. We must swallow our pride, we must accept our punishment, and we must grow from it. There is always a punishment for sin. There will always be punishment for sin. It does blind you. Blinding will take place as we lose our moral compass. And it, it can also bind you. Binding will result as we lose our freedom and our liberty. And it can grind you. And we'll spend the rest of our lives grinding out a purposeless existence. <laughs> what a horrible sight Samson must have been. Head shaved, in the eye sockets, full of puffs, looking ugly, downcast, head deprived, and all of the pride that once resided in him was gone. And a life that was devoid of the presence of God's punishment was so great, but it was exactly what it took to make Samson finally turn to God for help. To finally rely on God for strength. And that's how we're going to close. And that's part of this story. We see the Philistines making a sport of Samson. They're captive. The man that tormented them for some 20 years. The man who had carried off the gate to their city. The man who could not bind, they could not bind or capture. Was to be used now as the main attraction and entertainment for a feast to one of their gods. And the feast was held thanks to this God for helping them capture Samson. And Samson is humiliated, but he does something in his final moments. He's humiliated, but he prays a prayer. In verse 28 of that same chapter, Samson called to the Lord and said, Lord God, remember me. Remember me. I pray that you give me strength. And he called upon the Lord Church, <laughs> acknowledging that his strength did come from the Creator. It wasn't him. It was a prayer of humiliation in his eyes because he had to realize that he didn't do any of those feats that he thought were so great on his own. And at the end of his life, he finally realized that it was God all along. And that God had never betrayed him, but was there all along, even though he stepped away from the presence. And so in that moment, he also prays that he may once again avenge the Philistines, not only for his two eyes, but to fulfill the will of God as well. He surrendered to God's plan, church. He placed himself second to his plans. And if we fall, if we do fall to temptation, we must do those two things that Samson did, and that's our last point as we close. We must seek forgiveness, and we sub must submit to God's plan and his favor. Psalm 38, 18. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then do what? Cleanse us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Samson, Samson lived his, his life his way and only turned to God in the final moments. And you know the rest of the story. Samson took the two middle pillars, which were the house where he stood and he was born up, his right hand and the other with his left. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the Lord, upon the people that were there. 
So the dead which he slew in his death were more than which he slew in his lifetime. And once he was submissive to the plans of God in his final act, he killed more Philistines when he died than he lived. We learn a great lesson from Samson about our relationship with God. We need to submit to God's plan. We need to submit to his plan rather sooner than later. It is so tragic that Samson waited until he was blind and chained before he accomplished God's purpose. How about you this morning? When it comes to your purpose, when it comes to your relationships, when it comes to your life with the Lord, what is the main temptation that you are facing? What's the main temptation that you are dealing with? And maybe there's more than one. How are you doing in avoiding that temptation? Are you flirting with it? Are you allowing yourself to be present in that temptation? Are you deeply engaged in it? Are you temporarily enjoying the benefits that it offers? Are you suffering from the consequences? Are your relationships suffering because you are avoiding the confrontation with your sin, with your temptation? Church, will you turn to God right now in these moments while you still have a life to live for Him? Or will you wait until your last breath to turn back to God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know each and every heart in this room. You know each and every one of our struggles, each and every one of our temptations, each and every one of our, our sins that we choose over you. Lord, give us a heart for repentance. Give us a vision to walk in a way that is humble before you, that keeps us away from temptation because it's so involved with your will for our life. Lord, help us to just be in present with you, be in a relationship with you, and to strive you more than anything else, Lord. Help us to learn from the example of Samson, the way he was disobedient to his parents, the way that he put his relationships with his wives and, and his relationships with his friends and his, his relationship with himself before you. Help us not make that same mistake, but instead, Lord, help us to learn from the victory he received at the end, the victory which honored you by putting your will first so that others may see your glory. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. We come to our last hymn. Maybe you're here today and you've never made Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here today and, and it's always been about you. It's never been about God's will for your life. But maybe you're here today and you want to surrender to the Lord. You want to receive salvation that only comes from accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and committing your life to living out His will. If that's you, then the words of this last hymn will ring true. Are you washed in the blood? The blood of Jesus covered you so that your sin has been set free. And are you desiring to live for him? Just stay forward. Maybe you're here today and you're looking for a church family. And if this is where God has called you, we would love to have you. As we dig deeper into his word to realize what his will is for our lives. So that we can hold each other accountable as we live it out. Does any decision at all? Decision at all, we ask you to come forward as we all stand and sing 259. Are you washing the blood? Please stand. Thank you.